this webinar is about SSE sizing. Now, you notice the subtitle, How Do We Clean That Dirty Water? And I do want to remind you of one thing. The problems that we're going to do in here are primarily effluent water. Remember, if you're doing sewage water, you need to make sure that you have a minimum velocity of two feet per second. So really, really important. Okay? What's the purpose of an SSE system? It's to clean up dirty water. And just how do we do that? By taking the dirty water and running it through the septic tank and then through a leach field. So it's going to come out of the house into a septic tank. Remember, every gallon in pushes a gallon out. Now, you could have a gravity feed system, which means you push it right into the leach field, or you could have a pumping chamber, which you'll push into the pumping chamber, and when the pumping chamber has the correct amount of water in it, it will turn on and move that water out into the leach field. There are three very simple questions you have to ask. How much, meaning gallons per minute, how high, meaning total elevation, and how far, meaning your total linear feet of pipe so you can calculate your friction loss. Those are the three questions. If you can answer those three questions, you're ready to go. In example one, and by the way, if you have the SSE training manual, we're on page 34. So we've got a three-bedroom house, and you notice what it says here, most local codes say 150 gallons per day per bedroom. Now, I have to word it that way because I'm speaking in generalities that uh, use a different way of doing it, all right? But generally speaking, it's 150 gallons per day per bedroom. You have to know your local codes so you follow those local codes because if your local codes are different, it could cause a problem if you're not following those codes. The land has been tested and at one half gallon per day per square foot. So we can put one half gallon of effluent water per day per square foot into this leach field that we're gonna make. At 150 gallons per day per bedroom, we have three bedrooms, that's 450 gallons per day that we need to eliminate. 450 gallons a day times one half gallon per square foot means that our leach field has to be a minimum of 900 square feet. So we have to find an area that's 900 square feet that we can put our leach field in. The layout, we're going to divide that 900 and we're going to make it 30 by 30. So we have 900 square feet here. We're going to use a 2 inch manifold 30 feet long because we're going to do a middle manifold application here. Now we're going to have 2 inch pipe coming out to that manifold so it's all two inch pipe all the way all right we're going to put 10 one inch laterals that are 15 feet long in here okay two on each side five deep there now the next thing is what are we going to put in for holes we're choosing to put in seven three sixteenths holes and of course they're going to go two feet apart now, the next question is, well, how much water is going to come out of a 3 16 hole? If you look on page 48, you're going to find this chart right here. And what this chart says is flow rate as a function of pressure head and hole diameter in drilled PVC pipe. So what we're going to look at here is we have to know what our operating head is. You can do it in PSI or you can do it in feet of head. Typically, they're going to tell you feet of head because it's very low PSI. Remember, the name of this system is called LPP, low pipe pressure. So when you look at our system here, right there what you see is you see the elbow that brings the pipe up. Now, it's going to be buried below the frost line. And before you bury it, the inspector is going to want to look at it. Now, what he's going to do is he's going to take the cap off of there. You're going to put a removable cap on there. He's going to take that cap off of there, and he's going to turn the system on. And he's going to measure how much water comes out of that pipe. Now, he's going to tell you, so you have to follow his direction. He's going to tell you how much water he wants coming up out of that pipe. So when he does his test, 
he'll, he'll tell you this is what I need so that, that way when you design your system you get that much head okay it's going to squirt up and it's going to be between two and five feet so he's going to tell you whether he wants two feet or three feet or four feet or five feet of head all right you have to design the system so that it equals that much head now remember you're going to have four of these pipes one in each corner all right now the system that we're working with requires four feet of head. We're using a 3 16 hole, so now all we do is just cross those two together, and you can see a 3 16 hole is going to give you 0.83 gallons of water. Here we start with a little bit of math. We've got seven holes per lateral. We've got 10 laterals. That's 70 holes we're going to allow 0.83 gallons per minute per hole so that means we need 58 gallons per minute the inspector is also going to tell you how many times a day you can turn your system on four doses a day means once every six hours three doses a day is once every eight hours because he's going to divide that 24 a day by however many doses he allows you all right, so our inspector is allowing us four doses a day. So if we divide the four doses a day into the 450 gallons, it means that we have to do about 113 gallons per dose. Now, if you divide the 113 gallons per dose by the 58 gallons per minute that we're going to be putting out there, it's going to come to almost a two-minute runtime. Okay, so that's how we calculate how long the pump has to be on once it turns on. Now, the next thing we're going to look at here is our system to see how far it is out to the field. And so here you can see it says we've got 200 feet of 2-inch pipe to the bed. Now, remember that 200 feet is including the two, there's two 45s here in this 200 feet, and there's three 90s and that 200 feet is including the pipe inside of this pit okay and there's three 90s there remember we talked about being able to pull the pump out without putting our face below the ground level there's also going to be one check valve in the system again this check valve can be vertical because we're just doing effluent water don't forget also you have to drill that eighth inch hole one to two inches above the discharge pipe and that's going to be for priming purposes okay from the off switch to the highest point that I have to pump this water that's what we're looking at here and we've got 20 feet friction loss through fittings in terms of equivalent length of pipe so here's our fitting type here's our equivalent length of pipe in feet based on the diameter of the pipe okay so we've got a standard 90, 2 inch is equal to 9 feet of straight pipe. Okay? A 45, 2 inch is equal to 4 feet of straight pipe. A check valve is equal to 17 feet of straight pipe. We've got two 45s. 2 times 4 is going to be 8. We've got three 90s. 3 times 9 is 27. We have one check valve, which is equal to 17. So if we add this up, this is the equivalent length of pipe for the fittings. And it comes out to be 52. Now we're going to add our, our total length of pipe together. So the actual length of pipe was 200. The equivalent length of pipe was 52. And don't forget, we've got a manifold that goes right down the middle that's also 2 inch, and it's 30 feet long. Okay, we add that all together. The effective length of pipe that we go to the friction loss chart in with is 282 feet of pipe. Now remember, the friction loss chart is written in 100 foot lengths, so we divide the 282 by 100, and we get 2.82 100 foot lengths of pipe. Now the question is, what do we multiply that by? And so we look in our friction loss chart here, and you notice that it says that this is the friction loss chart for Schedule 40 rigid PVC. This is on page uh, 50, I believe. It says friction loss of water 
in feet per 100 feet of pipe. Now this is based on the Williams and Hazing formula and whoever put this chart together said we're going to use a constant of 150. I want you to understand why certain pipe friction loss charts are different from other friction loss charts. And sometimes it's just a matter of what they use for a constant. So some engineers might use 140 for, for Schedule 40. Other engineers like this one here is using 150. So you just have to understand what your engineer is using. Okay, and then you pick the one that you're most comfortable with. Now, across the top there, you notice we go from 3 quarter all the way to 6 inch pipe. On the left hand side is our U.S. gallons. I stopped it at 800. If you look in the 2 inch pipe section there, you're going to notice that there are two columns in each one of these pipe sizes. The first column says velocity in feet per second. The second column says head loss per 100 feet of pipe. All right. Now remember, we want to try and keep that velocity below 5 feet per second. 7 is a max. 7 is the max. We don't want it to go over 7. So we look at 60 gallons a minute here, and the friction loss at 60 gallons a minute is going to be 5.6. So we take 2.82 times 5.6, and we wind up with 15.8. We'll round that off to 16, and we're going to say that the friction loss in the 2-inch pipe is 16 feet. Now, there are 10 1-inch laterals. They are 15 feet long, and those 10 laterals are going to distribute 58 gallons a minute, which means there's going to be 5.8 gallons per minute per lateral. 15 divided by 100 means I have 0.1500 foot lengths of pipe here. If I look at my friction loss chart again, this time I'm going with 6 gallons a minute at 1 inch, which is 2.15. So I take 0.15 times 2.15, and I get 0.32. And you can guess what I'm going to do. I'm going to round that off to 1. Okay. So my total friction loss, I have 1 foot of friction loss in my 1 inch pipe. I have 16 feet of friction loss in my 2 inch pipe for a total of 17 feet of friction loss. Our elevation difference was 20 feet, and the spurt required was 4 feet. So we add that all together, and we come out with 58 gallons a minute at 41 feet ahead. All right? That's what we're looking for, a pump that'll do that. So I want you to know there is more than one choice but to keep everybody on the same page and so we all get the same answer we're going to look at the ME series performance curves remember Myers brand is the brand that we sell for sewage pumps SSE okay so we go uh, 58 gallons a minute at 41 feet ahead boy you can't get much better than that can you so we're kinda right on that ME 75 line so in this case, we would choose an ME75. Next problem, example two. Now the first one was what we called LPP, low pipe pressure. This one is called pump and dump. Both the LPP and the pump and dump are dosing systems. Okay, Pump and dump means we're going to collect a certain amount of water, and then we're going to put that water out into the field. Now, of course, we're going to let a gravity feed once we get it out there. So we're going to do things a little differently this time. All right, so it says a dosing system. We are going to fill the system up with, uh, without building pressure and then let gravity do its thing. Okay, We're going to change things a little bit and say we got a four-bedroom house. Now, of course, four-bedroom house at 150 gallons per day means we need 600 gallons that we have to be able to get rid of. Understand that I know and you know you're not going to get rid of 600 gallons every day because you're not going to have 600 gallons every day. You go on vacation, you're gone for a week, you're not using the, the facilities at all, you're not doing laundry at all, and so therefore there's no way you're using 600 gallons a day. But you have to size the system for that so that when you are home, 
the system can handle it. The fact that it's a dosing system means that it's only going to dose when there's enough water there. It's not turning that pump on if there's not enough water there. Our test came out the same as it did before, a half a gallon per square foot per day. So how big does our field need to be this time? A half a gallon times 600 gallons is going to be 1,200 square feet. Now we're going to choose to use a 30 by 40 trenching system. On the last one, we used a bed. This time, we're going to use a trenching system. So the layout is going to look like this, 30 feet by 40 feet. We're going to dig trenches. The trench is going to be 40 foot long here, and we're going to put a 4-inch pipe as a lateral in there. Then we're going to go 30 feet in this direction with 4-inch pipe. Now, again, remember, the purpose of using the big pipe here is because we want to fill the system up and then let it gravity feed out slowly. We don't want to force it out. All right. So that being the case, we're going to use bigger pipe. Now, of course, we don't need 4-inch pipe to get the water to the system. But how much water can we really fit in this system? So there are five laterals at 30 foot each. That means we have a total of 150 feet a four inch pipe just in the laterals. Pi r squared, and we, we kind of remember that from high school. Pi r squared is the volume of an area. To get the depth, or to get the volume of it, the uh, pi r squared is the area. To get the volume, we got to add the depth of the area. Okay? So we convert area times depth to cubic inches. And then we divide the cubic inches by 1728, and that tells us how many cubic feet there are. Then we multiply that number by 7.486, because that's how many gallons are in a cubic foot, and we know how many gallons of water are going to hold in our... You, you probably don't like doing that, do you? Okay. Or we could do this. We could just look at the chart on page 50, and um, you can see here it says... Volume of Schedule 40 PVC. 4-inch Schedule 40 PVC holds 0.65 gallons per foot. Now it's a real easy math problem because all we do is we take the 0.65 gallons per foot times the 150 feet and we come up with 97 gallons. Now don't forget we've also got a 40-foot manifold. We could have just added it to the 150, but what the heck, I like doing math. So... 0.65 times 40 is 26 gallons. 26 gallons plus 97 gallons means the total amount of water in the trench is going to be 123 gallons. This is what our system looks like here, and we tried to change it up just a little bit. So when you look at it from the off switch to the highest point we have to pump the water, this time is only 15 feet. Okay? Instead of having 200 feet, we have 120 feet of 2-inch pipe. We've got those 245s here. We've got the 390s in the pit, and we've got a check valve in the pit. Don't forget to drill your 8-inch hole 2 inches above the discharge so for priming purposes. All right. Our 245s aren't going to change any. They're still going to be 8 feet. Our 390s are going to stay the same at 27, and our check valve is going to stay the same at 17, which means we still have 52 feet of equivalent length of pipe. Now, our total actual length of pipe is 120. Add the equivalent length of pipe of 52, and remember, that's all the 2-inch pipe there is. So now, our total length of pipe is 172. Take the 172, divide it by 100, and you get 1.72 100-foot lengths of pipe. Okay? So now we've got 1.72 100-foot lengths of pipe, but what size pipe should we use? All right? Now we're, we're going from the pit to the uh, field. Remember, in the field, we're going to use 4-inch pipe. Okay? So if we use 2-inch pipe, which is pretty normal you're going to find a uh, loss in feet at 50 gallons a minute to be 4. Notice 50 gallons a minute gets us under the 5 feet per second. Remember, you can go to 7 if you really want to. Okay? So if we use 4 feet, because we're going to do 50 gallons a minute, 
that means we take 1.72 times 4 is 6.88. Of course, I'm going to round that up to 7. Okay. The friction loss in the 4-inch pipe, i, I got to tell you right now, experience is what's talking. One foot. At 50 gallons a minute through 4-inch pipe, there's very, very, very minimal friction loss. So we'll count it as one foot just to say we counted it. Okay, so seven feet for the two inch pipe, one foot for the four inch pipe, that's eight feet of friction loss. Our elevation difference is 15, our flow rate is 50. Remember, there is no squirt here because we're not going to pressurize the system. So at 50 gallons a minute, we need 23 feet of head. All right, now we're going to take a look here at the same curve that we did before. This time we've got 50 gallons a minute at 23 feet of head and you can see we are a considerable distance away from even the ME50. Now of course what that simply means is this the pump is going to do more than 50 gallons a minute. Remember the pump does what the system allows the pump to do flat out. That's the answer. The pump does whatever the system says the pump can do. So we want 50 at 23. The system says, oh, you can do more than that. Okay? So the question is, how much more is it going to do? Now, why is that question important? And the answer is, I'm setting a timer. I'm telling the pump how long it has to run. And if I tell it the wrong time, I'm not going to get what I want out of there, and I could be in trouble, okay? So, the pump can only work the curve, which means it's going to do whatever the system allows it to do, all right? Because the curve shows no pump that will do 50 gallons a minute at 23 feet of head, there are three steps we have to take. The first step says choose the pump curve and note the flow at the head you were looking for. So we were looking at 23 feet of head. If you were real spot on there, you watched and saw 23 feet of head hit that curve at about 78 gallons a minute. Okay, so our flow rate at 23 feet of head is 78 gallons a minute. The next thing says, let's subtract the flow required from the flow that the pump will produce at the head required. So the pump can do 78, we want 50, that's a difference of 28 gallons a minute. Step 3 says take two-thirds of the difference and add it to the required flow. That should be your new flow and head. So if we take two-thirds of 28, we get 18.48. I, of course, am going to round it up to 19. 19 plus 50 is 69. So what we're saying is, if we recalculate this, we should be right around 69 gallons a minute. So let's go ahead and do that. Now, of course, this time I'm going to do interpolating. Yes, I know 69 versus 70 doesn't seem worth it. You're right, but that's beside the point. If you don't know how to do it, you don't know you can't do it. So I'm going to show you how to do it so you can do it. That way, if you get one that's in the middle, it's easier to figure out. Okay? So we're going to look at our 2-inch pipe, and we're going to say at 70 gallons a minute, we have 7.4 feet of friction loss per 100 feet of pipe. At 60 gallons a minute, we have 5.6 feet of head loss per 100 feet of pipe. The difference is 1.8 feet of head per 100 feet of pipe. 69 gallons per minute is 90% greater than 60 and it's 10% less than 70 gallons a minute. That being the case, you can take 10% of the 1.8, which is 0.18, subtract it from the 7.4 that you're going to have at 70 gallons a minute, and that's going to leave 7.22. Or you can add 90% of 1.8, which is 1.62, to the 5.6, and guess what it equals? 7.22. Okay? So, 7.22 
feet of head loss per 100 feet of pipe should be the friction loss in our 2 inch pipe okay at 69 gallons a minute our total loss now 7.22 times 1.72 because that's how many 100 foot lengths of pipe we have is 12.41 we'll round that up to 13 so we got 13 feet of friction loss Okay, remember in the one inch pipe or in the four inch pipe, we had one foot of friction loss. That makes our total friction loss 14 feet. Our elevation still 15, and that's all we need. So at 69 gallons a minute, we have a total friction loss of 29 feet. If we go back to our curve, we look at 69 gallons a minute and 29 feet of head. Look at that, you're right on that curve, right where you want to be. Now, I'm going to tell you the truth. The formula I gave you is pretty darn accurate if you're using effluent or clear water. When you're using sewage pumps, it's a little different. It'll get you close, and that's what you need. You need to be close, okay? So I'm not going to say not to use it with sewage applications, but just remember, if you use it with a sewage application, it's not going to be quite as dead on as this is, okay? That's where we were, look at where we are, by just interpolating and adding things up, okay? So we're going to use the Myers ME50 for this job. Now, the next thing that we're going to talk about here, and this starts, I believe, page 44, we're going to determine the basin size. This is really, really important because if you want to get the proper run time out of that pump, you have to have the right size basin. So, determine your flow rate. What does the system require? That's the first step. The second step says, determine the basin diameter. Here's the important thing to remember, especially if this is an afterthought. Okay, this isn't going in a brand new house. This is saying, oh, you know what? I need to put this in so I can, I can put a bathroom downstairs. Okay? A basin has a two inch rim. So what that means is a 36 diameter basin is 36 on the inside. It's going to be 40 inches on the outside. Now the reason I'm telling you this is because if you've got a 36 inch door and say, oh, well, I can get this 36 inch basin into my basement because I got a 36 inch door, the answer is no, you can't because you got a 40 inch basin there. So it's really, really important that you remember that two-inch lip. All right? Determine the basin depth. Now, again, basin diameter helps you determine how much water you can store. If you can't get the diameter you want, then see if you can add depth to the basin. Okay? Because, again, you're going to be able to take a look at this say, okay, I can't use a 36-inch basin, let's put a 30-inch basin in. But remember, a 30-inch basin doesn't hold as much water as a 36 per foot. So if I make it deeper, I can still get the water that I require. Okay? So where is the, where is the depth measured from in the basin? That's the important point. And it's measured from the bottom of the inlet to the off switch. That's your usable water. Okay, we don't worry about the water that's uh, on the bottom there. That water is never going to leave. And you don't want to bring the water back into the house, so you don't want to go above that inlet. So you want to make sure you've got plenty of room between the off switch and the inlet to accommodate the amount of water you want and get that pump turned on. Okay. So overall basin depth is really important again here because you're going you're gonna to be able to know how much water. Now I'm going to show you that right now because step four says let's take a look at basin sizing guide. Okay, So the basin sizing guide says if you're using an 18 inch basin, one foot of basin is going to hold 13 gallons. If you're using a 24 inch basin, it's going to hold 23 gallons. A 30 inch basin holds 36. A 36 inch basin holds 53. A 42 inch basin is 72. A 48 is 94. A 60 is 146. A 72 is 211 gallons. 
Now, I want you to know when I first went into customer service back in 1992, my specialty was SSE. So even though I was an East Region rep, when someone had a problem and they're going, I can't figure this out, they would send me the SSE problems. I became very close to a gentleman who works at AK. AK is where we used to buy our, our basins from. Okay, his name was Daryl, and Daryl and I worked very closely together. I used to sell a ton of specialty basins. Now, here's the thing. I went to Daryl. I figured this out. I went to Daryl, and I said, Daryl, have I got this right? And he came back and said, yes, you've got it right. So I'm very, very certain. Remember the formula, pi r squared, and then you take that by the depth, turn that into cubic feet, and then multiply that by 7.486 okay I did all the work for you I did all the work for you all you have to do is look at this chart and say okay a 36 inch basin has 53 gallons per foot now remember that's per foot of usable basin and the reason I say that because we're going to do an example here in our example we're going to use that 36 inch basin it's going to be 60 inches deep which is 5 feet the inlet is going to be 2 feet from the top. So there's our 36 by 60 inch basin. Our inlet is two feet from the top. Don't forget, I always like to count the bottom 12 inches as non usable because the bottom line is it's going to be full of water. Okay? It might only be 10 to 12 or 10 to 8, but I'm still going to call it 12 inches just to be on the safe side. Okay? What does it leave me from there to there? 24 inches. 24 inches is 2 feet. At 53 gallons per foot, it means I've got a total of 106 gallons that I can use here. Okay? So I have to ask myself, how much do I need? Will this be enough? Don't worry about the amount of space that the pump occupies. Remember, most of it's going to be underwater anyway, so it's going to take up very little space. Okay? This is a really important slide. It talks about the use of an anti-flotation flange. Notice what it says when necessary. An anti-flotation flange is very similar to that lip that's on the top of the basin only you're going to put it on the bottom of the basin. Okay? So an anti-flotation flange goes on the bottom of the basin. I'm going to tell you the honest truth. If you want an anti-flotation flange on there, it is in your best interest to tell us right away so that when you buy the basin from us, we, sell, we give you a specialty basin so that that way uh, it takes a little longer to get, but you don't have to put that, that lip on. Because the bottom line is, if you have to put that lip on, you have to make sure that it is going to be waterproof. They do not want that water leaking out of it. Even though they're going to send it over to the leach field, they don't want water leaking out of this thing. Okay? So you would have to bolt it. You would have to make sure that you had the proper washers so that, that way you could bolt it and keep the water in. The easiest way to do it, order it from us that way we will we will fiberglass that right on there and you won't have to worry about it okay now anti-flotation flanges are used in areas where you have high water tables I'll tell you a little story uh, Grand Island Nebraska is where we do our factory schools for Berkeley and out in Grand Island, Nebraska, they say if you go down about three or four feet, you're going to hit water. So basements there always have to have uh, sump pumps and backup sump pumps because those pumps are running continuously, keeping the basement dry. All right? So the same thing is true of this pit. If you put this pit down in there and you don't have an anti-flotation flange on it, that pit becomes a bobber and the force, the pressure of the water just pushes the basin right up and you break all your piping and everything and trust me, that just is no fun at all. So what you're going to do here in order to anchor this down, you, you buy the basin with the anti-flotation flange on it, 
okay then what you do is you dig a pit big enough to hold an equivalent amount of cement that the basin would hold so you calculate the cubic yards of cement that would fit in that basin and then put those cubic yards of cement in that hole and make sure that when you put the basin in you sink it about six inches below the surface of the cement that way when it hardens all up it's an anchor it's an anchor now I had one guy say to me one time well wait a second you know uh, uh, that pump weighs a lot and of course you said there's always going to be a foot of water in there so so why do I have to put enough cement for all that why don't I just calculate if you want to take the time to calculate it go ahead and do it the easy money says calculate how much the total is and put the total in there okay that way you don't have to try and calculate how much does the pump weigh how much does that much water weigh is that amount of water always going to be in there and worry about is it going to work or not okay so pi r square is area area times depth is volume area will always be in cubic inches so divide it by uh, 1728 you get cubic feet and divide that uh, by 27 to get cubic yards so that's how you figure out how many cubic yards of cement you're going to need all right so we look forward to seeing you on the next webinar thank you very much